Hey guys, Whitney here. Welcome to the Passive Investing Made Simple Show. I'm your host, Whitney Elkins Hutton, Director of Investor Education here at PassiveInvesting.com. And I am so excited. I have such an amazing guest uh, lined up for us today, an amazing conversation. For all of you who are passive investors and are trying to struggle, you're struggling with time, distraction, prioritization, I have the man in the room, but if you're here, you're watching the video, you know who I'm talking about. But if you're listening to us live, you're going to have to wait a few minutes for before I share with you who I got here with you. Anyways, for those of you who are, this is your first time joining us, we do this weekly live webinar every Tuesday to help you learn the ins and outs of passive investing so you can go into your next deal with confidence. So make sure you check out PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com to get access to future masterclasses, boot camps, see our open deals, but also to stellar guests like who I have on here today. All right, guys, you're in for a treat. Jay Papazan, the author of The One Thing, thank you so much for joining us here today. We are oh. so blessed to have you in the room. Thanks for having me. I love to talk wealth building. You know this. And uh, I love to talk the one thing and how to get people better results. So these are two of my favorite topics we get to weave together. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So Jay, let's start. It started off. Um, just, you know, give us a quick little background for people who have been living in Iraq and don't know what the one thing is and don't know who you are. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I have been following Jay and Gary when they first published this book, like, mm -hmm. Six years ago, seven years ago? How long is ten, it? Ten. Ten. It was ten last year. 10, 000, 2013 is when it actually officially debuted. Awesome. Okay. Well, so I've been in the uh, a huge follower of this uh this book, this movement, really, for the past seven years. And it has completely changed my life. But Jake, before I like, you know, kind of steal your thunder, just tell us a little about <laughs> you, what you do, and kind of what led to you writing this book, the one thing. Sure. And just interrupt me if I'm going too deep in one direction. So uh, I'll just, you know, my wife, Wendy, right? She helped me facilitate the event that you were uh, one of our wonderful sponsors at. So when we got married in, in New York, I was in publishing at that time. Uh, we quit our jobs because we knew we didn't want to start a family in New York. And we went backpacking for like five months. And Lo and behold, we picked three cities, one of which was Austin, that we thought we wanted to move to. And so in early 2000, we came to Austin for a visit, loved it so much. We moved here without any friends, any family or jobs and just started our new life here. And after about five months of freelancing, I'd been an editor. There was no big publishing here. I had been at HarperCollins. Um, I was trying to be a magazine writer. And... I think I made $15,000 in income in our first year of marriage, like back stateside, not great. So Wendy just said, hey, this is not happening fast enough. Go get a job. And I was happy to as well, because I just, I was an introvert, not meeting anybody. I took a job at a little company called Keller Williams. So in 2000, September, when I joined, there were 27 employees and there were 6,700 agents. Today, um, I think we have 176,000 agents in 54 countries. So like I've Huge. been blessed to work directly with Gary Keller, the founder, and kind of watch this go from a very small regional company to the largest um, real estate company under one brand in the world. And lots of lessons there that may show up, but we wrote our first book together. He found out I was in publishing in 2002, summer of 2002. We wrote a book called The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. And we interviewed um, in depth seven, 27 of the top real estate salespeople in, in the world at that time. We tried to interview 100, but not everybody would take our call because who are you? Whatever, right? Um, but we managed to profile them. That book went on to sell, I think it sold 1.6 million copies. And that created a lot of momentum. We had to self-publish. Um, nobody would publish us, but the American Management Association, I said no, but we sold 100,000 copies by ourselves that first year. And then everybody called us. And when we signed up with McGraw-Hill, at that time, they were one of the top business publishers in the early 2000s. 
um, we kind of came up with the idea, and this is probably how you became aware of us, but if you did before the one thing, our next big book was The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. And y'all are going to hear me talk about this because the first book, I was the editor and kind of ghostwriter. I didn't know enough about the industry. But when we decided to write The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, I got to lead the research. Dave Jinks hadn't done a lot, but he was just super smart. He was our other co-author. Gary had done a lot, but he hadn't done as much rigorous research. So I interviewed 120 um, net worth millionaires. Um, it might've been 124 total. I can't remember. Um, but I've got binders that I could show you. They're on the floor. These giant eight inch binders that have every interview that I did and there's highlights. And like, that was kind of the first run at writing that book. And I remember that was life-changing. I go, went back to my wife, Wendy, who I mentioned earlier. And I just said, do you want to become millionaires? And she's like, sure, let's go for it. And we started investing, having never invested um, in real estate, looking for that blessed passive income. And uh, I think it took us about seven and a half years to become net worth millionaires, longer to hit our cash flow goals, which are much harder to get. And we can go into that maybe later. Anyway, we wrote... We've written, I think, 11 books total. Not all of them have our names on them, but the big ones were The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, a book called Shift, which is how to navigate the sales industry and real estate during like the Great Recession. Um, and then the one thing is like by far the biggest of all of them. It sold over 3 million copies to date. It's been translated, I think, into 42 languages. Um, and that's how, maybe that's how you got to know us was through that book. And uh, it's changed my life. I mean, I was, we took us four and a half years to research that book. It was a very long project. It was our first non-real estate book. And so we were being very careful that we didn't um, kind of overstep, right? We'd had all of the success in the real estate category. Gary was an icon in the real estate category. Um, when people got excited about it meeting me, it was always at a real estate convention. Nobody knew who I was outside of that. I, I told my wife, it's like I'm a champion duck caller or something. If I go into Bass Pro Shop, there are people who know me, but everywhere else I get to be anonymous. Um, the one oh. thing kind of took that to a different level because it's not about real estate. So that's kind of the short version, not so short version, but focused on my book career. And I partnered with Gary, so we own a few co companies together along the way. So we've built businesses together. I built businesses with Wendy. We own a portfolio of real estate. We own a portfolio of business interests. So we've kind of got assets in multiple categories. Um, but our number one goal, which aligns with your mission, I call it unearned income. The goal of all of this is not a number on a spreadsheet. Um, I want a certain amount of unearned income. Our goal is to finance our life mission without having to work. We call that wealth building, right? Mm -hmm. So when I have enough passive or unearned income to finance my life's mission without me having to have a job, I'm a very, very happy man. Well, and that's what so many of our listeners are here today is to learn how the one thing, the process of the one thing, the concepts, the principles of the one thing can help them um, uh, scale a portfolio faster, simpler in that unearned income. And just to kind of put a caveat on it, most everybody that's listening to the podcast here today, they're focused on investing in other people's real estate businesses, right. not scaling any of their own. And so let, let's tackle our first question. Like, why is it important to, um, well, actually, I'm going to ask my second question. As a passive investor, how can the principles of the one thing uh, be applied to help streamline somebody's uh, decision-making process in passive investing? Well, the like the fundamental kind of principle of the one thing is that at any given time, you can only have one priority. And if you know, if you're really clear about that priority, we tend to give it more time and energy and get better results. And we use Pareto's principle often to determine what should be our priority on this journey to getting a goal. And Pareto's principle is the 80-20 rule where the majority of what we want will come from the minority of what we do. Those 
often shows up as 20% of what we do gives us 80% of the results. Um, but it varies. It's usually a minority of what we do gives us the majority of what we want. And the one thing was all about just keep taking the 20% until you figure out what the very first domino is, the very first one that starts the whole chain reaction and let that be your focus. And that's a massive oversimplification of a 240 page book. But like if people only heard one thing, take the 20% of the 20% until you get to the lead activity that drives the majority of your success and then make a stand around doing that every day. So what do you think for ahead. investors that, that that lead activity is? Well, that might be something we arrive at together. I have a theory. Um, first off, the reason I call it unearned, and this could just be nuances, I have yet to see any investment truly be passive. Sometimes you put work in up front and then you get income for very long periods of time, like writing a book. I'm, I do some promotion, very little, after the book has been out for a few years, but I still receive income. So it's one of those that gets less and less earned as time goes on. Um, but when I make an investment in a syndication, I have, still have work to do. I have to do due diligence. And so like, I'm trying to get the, the, the least amount of job income, the most amount of unearned income. So it's just Mentally, I think we're saying the same thing. Um, so I'll come back to the core tenets of all of my investing. Are you super clear about your criteria? Are you super clear about the terms that you're looking for? And number three, like, do you have the right network relationships or deal flow from some activity to get you those things? And I think like, if I had to sum it up, the answer to the first question is deal flow. If you can figure out, here's what I'm looking for. Here's how I'd, I'd ideally like to set up the deal. If you can get enough opportunities, you will find opportunities that match your criteria and terms. And if you've thought about those correctly, it's money in the bank. I mean, barring a 9-11 event, like we all know that there can be crazy things that throw off the, even the most safe investments. So that said, I'll come back like, for me in the beginning of my real estate investing, I just wanted to analyze as many deals as possible. And that was for me to get really clear on what I was looking for and what represented a bargain and what wasn't a bargain. If you're the first person who shows up and say, I've got this passive investing deal, that's an act of faith. If it's the, the only one I've ever seen, or I haven't had taken the time or you haven't taken the time to educate me. So I really understand what's normal and what's not normal. And so like, I want to have good perspective. And I remember like before we made our first investment, I did the math on like a hundred real estate investments or more. And what's crazy is having done all that work when one did show up, it was like someone had a giant, you know, the bat beacon and the Batman movies. Like it was like fireworks. It was like so obvious by the time it showed up, I was like, well, this, we got to run. Like this doesn't show up that often. And it's so clearly potentially a winner. So that's what goes through my mind is like, we're going to narrow our focus. We're not going to invest in just anything. We've got a set of criteria. We've got some terms and those both need to add up to this is largely passive or unearned income. I'm not buying a job. I'm not going to become a landlord. That's your job. I'm taking a lesser return for that to be your job. I'm not going to have to structure or negotiate the terms. That's your job. Right. So I've got to be clear about what I'm looking for and accept that there's a set of return rates that goes with that. Right. And then I'd go out and try to find the best version of that I can humanly can. My number one way to do that is through network. If I know the right people, and I'm pointing at you for those who are just listening, if I know the right people, I know that there's this kind of virtuous cycle that happens. Right. When you are a solo investor and say, I'm looking for, I'm just going to use a real estate example. I'm looking for residential single family properties that are four sided brick that have um, two to three bedrooms and at least one and a half to two bathrooms. And that's a, that's a specific set of criteria. And I'd like it to be roughly in these zip codes. The more times you tell people, simple, repeatable criteria, the more people realize, oh, that guy, Jay, you've got a four-sided square house. How many bedrooms again? 
How many bathrooms? What part of town? Actually, I think I know who your buyer is. People start to think of you when they see your opportunity, but because it's specific, it's repeatable, it's concise, it's not 15 pages of spreadsheets, you give out your criteria in a, in a way that people can process and remember, and then they start to bring you deals. Terms comes in the negotiation. Um, I've got some that are like, that I like, but that I mostly focus on my criteria and I will trade price and terms depending on the situation. But now my network brings me those deals. Now yeah. you are amplified. I'm just going to say like, you tell me if I'm right. I have a couple of friends that do what you do. You've got criteria that was working so well, you started sourcing money from other people to join in the fund and to participate in it. Now, not only do people know you as a reliable buyer for certain kinds of assets, they know that you also bring other capital to purchase them, which is an amplification in your deal flow and the number of deals that you get to say no to in order to say yes to the good ones. Is that hypothetically like lining up a little bit for you there, Whitney? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I mean, so um, what I just to kind of sound it back, and this is something that we talk a lot about on the masterclass show, especially in our skills boot camps, and we just kicked it off last week for um, the series again. Is that as a passive investor, you have to get crystal clear on what you want, your goals, criteria, you capital preservation. Do you need cash flow, equity growth, tax benefits, and then there's like several other amplifiers that we spend a lot of time talking about. Um, but also, how do you want to spend your time, right? Mm -hmm. Because passive investing, while I think it has a role in everybody's portfolio, not everybody's ready for it at the exact same time, right? Are you in your capital growth phase? Are you, you know, leaning towards retirement? You know, each one of those, like the cash flow and the equity pieces, those are going to play, have different levers at different port points in time and scaling your portfolio. So I love that you fact you started with, like, you have to get extremely clear yeah. um, on what it is that you want. That way, if you can get clear, then you know, when you start looking at operators, you can say that operator's business plan, they don't, it doesn't fit my portfolio. I can move on. Right. Um, and maybe you say no for different reasons. Maybe you don't know, love and trust them, but like, you know, if you're just like the operator is amazing, but it doesn't fit my portfolio. That's, that's a good way to say no as well, or not now. Yeah. Um, they say bet on the jockey, not the horse, but that exactly. actually isn't the way horse racing money is won. You bet on the horse and it, <laughs> hopefully the jockey too. But I, I have made investments in people but mm -hmm. I also knew that they were a little speculative. I wanted to invest in someone because I believed in them. And there's a little speculation inherent in that. But mm -hmm. I also made piece a small investment, like $5,000 in a former employee, $25,000 in a former employee. And I'm just kind of like, if it goes up in smoke, I still feel good about it. But um, the way I look at it is like, we have a thing called the, the path of money. And, and like, I, I like this model there's only four kinds of investments. They're either passive or active and either you're owning things or lending money. So like the lowest returns are when you lend money passively. That's a savings account. That's a money market account, right? That's a, a treasury bill. You've loaned, effectively loaning money to the bank or the government and it's very safe, but there's also very low rates of return, right? Then you have passive investing. And this is where I want to debate with you because I'm trying to, I was thinking about this interview this morning, Whitney, and I was like, I actually don't think you're in the passive investing. Passive investing to me is buying stocks and mutual funds. I can own pieces of lots of companies. All I have to do is do a transaction on my phone. I've got no job duties. I mean, it is 100% passive. And like we all know, like historically, you're going to get 8 to 12% return right? On any long-term period of time. Now go to active. You can do active lending, hard money loans. Like it's amazing private financing. Like not only do you get a really nice rate of return, you get the asset if they default, right? So you are the bank. There is some work involved in that though. Active ownership is buying businesses and real estate. I actually think, and so tell me if I'm right, that's the highest rate of return you can get. Active ownership of 
of real estate and businesses. And that is direct for the most part. I yeah, actually think you... when I do syndications, I'm just getting an extra source of leverage on a force of, it's an active investment for the most part, because those rates of return also tend to be higher than passive investing. Does that make sense? And you know, whenever you bucket it that way, I could totally see that because you're you're investing in an active business, but you're taking a passive role is essentially is how you're categorizing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a direct active investment. You're doing all the active part, right? Your service does. Like I put some money with um Brandon Turner's Better Life, one of his. I did some money with Cody Sanchez. She's doing some business investing. And like I've seen the portfolio, I've seen their criteria. But I just don't, like Wendy and I are moving towards a more passive, but I also know not everybody gets to do that, right? I'm getting access to off-market deals and more active deal flow and the rates of return are much higher. So I almost feel like there's a hybrid category going into this conversation. I'm going to have to update my model. <laughs> well, and we want to see that model whenever you have it updated for sure. But I, <laughs> I totally do what you're, I totally, you know, understand that the path you're going down. So you're viewing this as, um, I'm investing in an active partnership. It's just that my role is the limited partner. I'm taking kind of a back. That is a great way of putting it. That is a great way of putting it. Yeah, because that explains the rates of returns. There is a little bit more risk there than like buying Apple stock, right? But it's a little, it, but you also have a much higher historical rate of return over time. Like my problem is I know people that will never become direct active investors in real estate or business. They just won't. They'll never do the work. They'll, if they do it, they'll do it poorly and they could lose money. And so they make all of their investments on this total, this other passive, in my language, not yours, quadrant that has low rates of return. And it's really hard to build wealth there unless you have a lot of time or a lot of money. By, by getting people into the kinds of investments that you're helping them with, this active partnerships, which is now I got a new language there, um, it's a way for them to accelerate their growth right? Because it is a higher rate of return than this other category, but it's also like, they also aren't getting a big job. So it's a really nice marriage of the two worlds. So I want to kind of- And Whitney is not paying me. Like I actually <laughs> like, so this is just us being friends and I'm intellectually trying to understand because I went from the active, we directly bought real estate and businesses to now at this stage of our life, I understand the game well enough to know a good deal, but I want to have other people doing a lot more of the work for me. Right. I don't want to have a job attached to as many investments as I used to. Well, let's lean in here for a moment. And um, so if somebody is either uh, two, I mean, possibly two people here, two types of investors, somebody who has been, you know, in the Apple stocks, bonds, and mutual fund world. And they're like, hey, I want this looks really cool to get over here. I'm enticed by the returns. Maybe I have some translatable skills with being able to like interview people and suss out yeah. good operators from bad operators, but it's hard for me to wrap around and create that process to where it's functional, right? Like, like, how do we get back to the one thing? How do we use those principles to help them make that transition? And then the second question, which is probably going to be answered a little bit later is somebody comes off of a 2023 year where they're like, okay, Jay, I hear you. I can make more returns here, but also I can get beat up a little bit more potentially. Yeah. Like how do I use the one thing to kind of get back on track with my investing? That's a big question. So I want to, I don't want to just throw out. Yeah, there's answer. actually two questions. I just asked the second one before I forgot it. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll go and I'll say, like, I, I do feel like I try to live the one thing approach. Mm -hmm. So I take advantage of, like, I I get a 401k. I take advantage of that. I max out the match. I don't, I'm not going to give up free money. But I also know I'm not going to become a stock trader. I'm not going to, I don't get any joy from that. And I also don't think I'm going to outperform professionals. So there's a great book out there called The Simple Path to Wealth. Yep. right here, JL Collins. And it it's a very approachable, understandable way to like for that quadrant, right? I think of there's different, I put money in different quadrants. I What I live on, what we give away, we have a certain amount of savings and reserves for our, our lives and businesses and then our investments. I've got those tax, some of the tax advantage things that we do because 
I've got a match of my 401k. I'd be foolish not to use it. I did it from the moment I had a job, I was putting 10%. I just follow this guy. So I, I just buy one S&P 500 mutual fund, very low yield. And I'm just trusting that the markets will do its job. I look at people who play that game. And a lot of times that kind of covers their minimums. For the other investments we do, active real estate, investing in active partnerships, like the ones that you offer, those sorts of things. I want money above that to do that. So I'm not choosing between the two. I've got what I would call like a very basic, roughly 10% of my income up to the limits goes into the 401k. I've been maxing it out for years. Um, I do the IRAs. We do them for our kids now. We're just taking advantage of those vehicles because they are advantaged vehicles. But you can become wealthy doing that. But I am unwilling to take the, that chance because I know that it will help me to have all of this long time horizon on these safe, really passive investments. I'm going to go over to this other quadrant and I'm going to set aside a certain amount of income that I'm willing to tolerate a slightly higher risk portfolio on that. But I'm also knowing that it accelerates. I can compound at a faster rate. You know, the law of 72, whatever your rate of return, divide that into 72. That'll tell me how many years it takes to double it. So if it's going to earn 7.2% over time, every 10 years, it's going to double right? And now you start going up. Like, it's really hard to find things that average people can invest in that you could literally look and say, this is going to be 15 to 25%. Like that kind of compounding is truly extraordinary, but I am finding it in these partnerships. And I am able to make the whole thing go faster. But I have like, what I'm going to call like my dead safe, boring, I'm not going to put a lot of energy into it, but I'm just going to play the conventional game. And we make sure that we live on less so we could set aside more. We did this for years when we didn't have much money so that we could also put some money to work at higher rates of return. And I just don't want to do that in a million errors. I'm not going to go become a Bitcoin master and a residential real estate master. And like, I don't need to do all those things, right? I need to pick a few categories that over time I can develop an unfair advantage around. I mean, I work for the largest residential real estate firm in the world. I'd be an idiot if I wasn't buying residential real estate. I've got so much more data than the average person. I get to hang out with people who've been working in this industry for decades. So like, I have all kinds of unfair information. And it's funny, like in the world of private real estate investments and business investments, it's not like the SEC rules. Like insider training, trading is legal. Like I actually know about homes before they come on the market because my wife's a realtor. And I can say, why don't we buy that? Why are we going to list that? Let's just buy it. If, if that was a stocks and that was Wall Street, you'd go to jail for that. So like there are areas in private investing in businesses and in real estate that you have you can develop an unfair advantage and you can drastically increase the odds that you will win and not lose. But I, I just... I think it's, I'm going to answer one of the other questions early because I'm just soapboxing a little bit here. I'm sorry. But I, my number one question is, can I survive the downside? For saying all of this, I'm a scaredy cat, Whitney. I, I really don't like to take unnecessary risk, which is one of the reasons I want an unfair advantage. I want a, a great informational advantage. I want to have partners with long track records of success. I want all of those things because I really would like to make an impact on the world with our gifts. That's ultimately what we're going to do with all of this. My kids know they're not getting rich. They're just, we're going to give, be giving lots and lots of money away to charity over the years. I challenge that. Your kids are going to be getting rich. They already have gotten rich, but uh, it's a different type of wealth. True. Right? They 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 think it's totally normal for us to own 14 houses. So like, there's no stigma to them about investment real estate or being in business. So yes, we've provided some informational examples for them to go build their own wealth and they will get some. Yes. It, that brings up a funny conversation. We were sitting at the dinner table last night and my husband and I were talking about an investment, a hotel investment that he and I have. And my daughter who's 11 and a half goes, we own a hotel. And I'm like, well, not by ourselves <laughs> with like a few other partners, but yes, we do. She was like, where is it? And I told her and she was like, well, let's go stay there. We should be able to stay there for free. And I'm like, that's not how this works. But 
I asked, I asked her, you know, this is, you want to talk about knowledge and passing on knowledge to kids and business chops. And I was like, what would happen if all the investors asked to go stay at the hotel for free? She goes, it wouldn't earn any income. I was like, you know what? <laughs> like mom won. Yay. <laughs> yeah. If she can recognize that at 11, we're, we're, we're on the right track here. Um, we own, we own part of a movie theater chain. And up until COVID, they would let us come in and we could get free tickets and free food and drink. And then after COVID, they said, you know what? We need to be a little bit more buttoned up than that. We do get some <laughs> special screenings and things as owners, which is nice. But yeah, I think if everybody takes partakes of too much of the free, then there is no business left. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I wanted to kind of continue down this path a little bit as far as, um, you know, you, you opened up, you know, the, the, the box as far as like, you know, passing on wealth, what is, you know, we know it's not monetarily, we know it's knowledge, but you know, what are some, what is, what are some other ways that you're passing on your wealth to either your kids or to others? You know, what are, what are your strategies here? Whenever you think you're, your overall generational wealth plan, what does that look like? So uh, we've spent the last few years getting really clear on how to set up. My wife and I have, have reciprocal trust, right? Um, some people call them slats, I think, is the lingo, but I'm not, like, I don't live in finance enough. I'm an English-French major at heart, but um, we worked and we tried to make sure that the assets that we felt like would have a lot of growth over time that could outstrip the kinds of, you know, your inheritance taxes and stuff. We wanted to put those in trust. And you kind of had to do that. You have their their um, irrevocable trust. Like once you get them in there, you can do some nudging around, but you can't revoke that. Like you're making a big decision. You should make it carefully. And we identified for each of us after we wanted to give our kids an opportunity to do some things like a down payment for a home to pay off college debt. I hate it when I say young people saddled with hundreds of thousands. I mean, I literally have an employee with hundreds of thousands of college debt. And it's so hard. It's so hard to come out of the starting gate when you have that much behind you. So the unfair advantage I will give them is that they can also have an opportunity to work in that world. But we identified our top three charities for each that we hope and believe will still be around. Um, but that, that, are an expression of the impact we want to have in our world. We also have our will for the assets that don't go into the trust. So we've just had to think a lot about, this is not just passing on wealth, this is also wealth preservation. At a certain point, there are people like, people go, oh, you must be so rich from your books. And I'm like, dude, you make your stacking quarters over here. Yes, we've done very well with two books. And that's real money, I'm not going to ignore it. But it's not like, I don't know, Wall Street banker money kind of thing. Like it's, I feel like every penny was earned for sure. But at the same time, like if we've worked so hard to build our wealth for the last two decades, um, I want to protect it. I don't want someone who thinks we're, I drive a Lamborghini instead of, you know, like I drove a Camry for like the first 17 years of this journey of stick shift, the CE, right? We're, we, we tend to be very frugal people. Like you are subject to lawsuits. That also just happens in any business that I'm watching it with some of my friends right now that have been named in suits just because people assume they have big pockets. So asset protection becomes a part of your game at a certain place. So that's part of this. And it's also what is our legacy plan? And for us, I just want to give a lot of money away. Along, I want to give a lot of it away along the way. I don't want it all to happen after I die. But when I've stopped working, which is still, we're still at the tail end of our wealth accumulation. I'd like to also, I mean, the guy who started Duty Free, have you heard his story? I have not, no. You look it up. He built Duty Free, this amazing company. And he ended up selling his portion of it for, I think, a couple of billion dollars. He set himself up on a salary and there were three company owned apartments that he lives in, but he basically makes a couple hundred grand a year. And then he spent the rest of his time giving away the $2 billion. And I saw an article, I think it was last year, or the year before that he gave away the last of the money. And I just got to imagine that's so gratifying to have built something so big and proud of it. Also know that like 
hey, I've got a, I've got places to live in three countries. I can afford to travel between them. But he still, you know, lived a fairly, I would think, a modest life for someone who had $2 billion because his focus wasn't how much can I spend for me? It's how much can I change the world in a positive way? And so I can't think of the guy's name, but he's the the guy at Duty Free. That's correct. I see that someone asked the question in the chat. So it was the, like in the airports, the Duty Free sh shops. That's the guy who started it. Amazing. I look for stories like that. The guy who started Five Hour Energy, I believe, gave away 100% of it. Um, there's a few of those stories out there that are great, great stories of philanthropy that inspire me. Have you ever read the book, uh, Die With Zero? Love it. Yeah. It's on my a... shelf of fame over here. I've got a, like, some of my favorite books, Bill Perkins. Yep. yep. Fantastic book. Yeah, that's a great book. Uh, you know, but to give wealth away, right? But also to learn how to live the wealth that you have accumulated, right? Like, you know, uh, how can you, uh, and which is the story that really resonates with me. Like my father, um, like he uh, had Parkinson's, you know, uh, was forced to retire in his mid fifties and wow. he worked so hard, so, so hard. I think I was telling the story at the retreat works so hard. And then, you know, you know, he hits about, you know, 55 and, you know, I think he and my mom took one vacation together and then his health started tanking. And anyways, it, it was just one of those things is like, how can you live life along the way? And that's one of the things that I think, you know, is so powerful about passive investing is that whenever you build these skills and you get really good at investing, identifying opportunities, identifying operators, that this can generate that, as you put it, Jay, unearned income right now to let you live life now, not in deferral. So I think that's yeah. just kind of so wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I've, yeah, there's so many stories that are sad too, but like we think of like when we're children and when we retire is our playtime. And then after we're kids, we have to work to learn. Like we have to learn what it is we're going to do, study, and then you work to earn and then you get to enjoy it. And I actually think that every single day, you should have a little play, a little learning, a little earning, right? You should have that all along the way. And so like that that message is something I've also tried to make sure I taught our kids. Like I know that there will be periods of time where you're all in on something, but don't postpone the important stuff because you just may not, you may not, luck may not be in your favor, right? You may be postponing something you don't get to enjoy. Gary tells the story of his um, stepmother, I believe, um, they were humble. They had a farm, a little farm outside of Austin, and they didn't travel much. They didn't have a lot of money, but they were saving for their retirement and she would make dresses. And those were the dresses that she would wear when they went traveling and their retirement. And within a year of their retirement, they'd both passed away from cancer. And he just was so sad opening that closet and all of those dresses that never got worn. And it's like, no, I think we can avoid that. Um, I think we can we can have we definitely want to enjoy life along the way. I want to give away along the way. I don't want it to just be this bequeathal after the way because it makes me feel good. So, um, you know, I want us to leave some time for our open Q and A. But so, Jay, like, you know, with somebody who's like listening to this and they're just like, okay, great, we've heard about like, you know. Uh, unearned income. We've heard about investing in other people's businesses. We've learned about the 80-20 principle. We've learned of like that we need to start kind of like living along the way. How did they start kind of ditching some of these concepts together into a workable plan to where they can focus and not get distracted by all these different, very important priorities in their life? So I think even, and I'm going to go to your language with passive investing, there's still a threshold we have to cross to earn the right to make those investments, right? So if I was going to line up the dominoes, I think first and foremost, um, know why you want to invest in what you're investing for. I think if you've got a clear vision, right? And it and hopefully it's beyond a dollar amount. If someone said, oh, I want to make a millionaire, I'd be like, great. And what will that do for you? That's for the last question. five, maybe six years, we've run an investment club, my wife and I meet once a month and we just do book reports and share and we hold everybody accountable to tracking their net worth. And I always ask when someone joins, it's like, why do you want to be a millionaire? What will that do for you? 
And most people answer either something along the lines of freedom, right? Or something along the lines of security and or a mix of the two. Those seem to be the two big themes, right? Um, and uh, I think it's really important to know that because the journey, especially in the beginning, requires a certain amount of, I don't want to say sacrifices in, in the worst sense, right? But you will maybe trade, make some trade-offs. And if you don't aren't clear why you're doing it, you may not make those trade-offs and therefore not get the reward. So first and foremost, your big why. Why are you going to do this at all? I think that's very powerful people to get them off the fence, to get them moving when they need to move, when they're paralyzed by analysis, all of those things. Remember, like you're working for freedom. You're working so that you never have to worry about paying the rent again. Like whatever the rationale is, that becomes the motivator to continue taking action, especially on the days you don't feel like it. Those are the difference makers. I think two, you've got to learn to live on less than your you earn, especially in the world that you're in. If you don't have money to invest, you ain't investing. And I will never, ever, I've known people that started this journey with credit cards. And I'm just like, I'm always horrified when they tell their story. And I maxed out 27 credit cards and look at me now. And I'm like, and no one ever should follow that advice. That's not advice. You, you were successful in spite of how you did it. So know why you're investing. Learn to live on less than you earn currently so that you have capital to invest. Then we get into the journey, right? So there's a series of dominoes and some, once you get through, you're through. Like I know what my big why is. It'll evolve over time. But like once that spark was lit, my wife and I got very good. We were living on between 60 and 70% of our income and investing the rest. And it was a game to us at a certain point. We were just like, okay, how long can we keep this car running? I know it looks like a POS out there, but that's it. And we're working real estate where people want to drive fancy cars and live in fancy houses. And our homes were just future rental properties to us. We we're like, well, should we put in the marble or we should put in something indestructive so that the future renters can't destroy it, right? And we just had a different mentality and that kept us going. And then you get to criteria terms and network, which I do believe are the 20% items for great long-term investors. If you're clear on your terms, if you under uh, clear on your criteria, you really understand how terms can make a deal better or worse, right? Um, and then you build out your network. Um, the last step is now just make the investments. And some people still need a little nudge to get over that. But um, if you're really, really careful on the first few, you then can survive one that's not so great. I do think that this, no matter how careful you are, bad luck will find you. I've done the house and found out that it had broken pipes under the foundation. There was no way we could have known. You know, we did all the usual tests. It would just, but it just was bad luck. And so we did six months of work to make, the IRS said we made $3,000 and I can't imagine we made any money. We had to pay taxes on that thing. And I was working every weekend for like five months. That was not a passive investment, by the way, but it was unlucky. And I just remember telling my wife, I was like, I'm glad this wasn't our first one because we probably would have never done it again. Mm -hmm. It's like and people who hire for the first time and have a bad experience and they say, well, I'm never hiring anyone again, right? We would never let our kids say something like that, but as adults, we do it sometimes. So get those criteria terms, network together, make that first investment. And I find that the, the more you do it, the more confident you get. And some of the confidence comes from knowing that, well, this is now my seventh syndication I've been a part of, and I'm getting returns on the first three now. And now I'm actually, I hate this expression, playing with house money, because it's still money. I don't care. Like, it's still money. Um, so don't just burn it. That's ridiculous. Um, but now I feel like I, I know that I'm reliably ahead. That doesn't mean I'm going to get careless but sometimes bad luck finds you and you can survive it now. Well, so Jay, that's the dominoes, right? If I had yeah. to, okay. Lining them up, lining them up, knocking them down. I love it. Well, Jay, there's been such a wealth of knowledge um, here on the show and we're almost out of time. Um, I do want to wrap, wrap up with one question. I mean, I know you spoke about your dominoes. You summed everything up, um, you know, pretty succinctly, but if there was, uh, one thing that you wanted people to take away from our discussion here today, what would it be? I mean, if we called the book Focus, nobody would have bought it. Um, I do think like 
if you can identify the criteria that you believe will work for you and generate deal flow, like opportunities, lots of no's to find your yeses, you're going to do great. And the challenge I find is people, they're watching social media, they're on TikTok, and they're chasing whatever the new criteria is. Oh, it's 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 storage facilities. Oh, those are gone now, right? You know, industrial spaces, it's overbuilt. It'll never be good. Um, if you're always chasing the fad, you'll never get great at anything. And understand their cycles. Um, when we first started investing, um, we didn't know anything. But very quickly, we were in the, the Great Recession, and people said, you'll never find a deal in the first years, like the whole market. And that's actually some of the best investments we've made. And then later, when those markets had gone up for five straight years after the recession was over, they said, well, that's over now, right? And I think we've averaged like on a couple of our properties, like 27% annual, you know, year over year growth. And there are things that are cyclic, but if you buy great fundamentals, you have the best long-term odds. And now you just want time to play out, in my opinion. I love time as my lever. The more years I have, I'm 54, still got plenty of them. The more time it has to compound and the magic of unrisky investing come back in my favor. Jay, amazing. That's like mic drop. I love it. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Jay, thank you so much for joining us here today. If people wanted to reach out to you, learn more about the one thing, how could they do so? Well, I can't hide is the honest truth. I believe, and no one has disproven the statement that I'm the only Jay Papazan in the of the 7 billion people on earth, that at least there's a Googleable record. Because if you Google me, you find me. And so um, the one thing.com obviously is where all things, the one thing are happening. Um, about every other month that we do a free webinar that I get to play in. Um, I'm obviously on the podcast sometimes and in social media. But if you Google me, you will find me. And although my assistant helps me sometimes, it's still me. If you DM me or message me, on any of LinkedIn or whatever, just be patient. That's not my number one job, but I will get back and do my very best to, to help you out. Awesome.